I'm going to talk about the Earth's radiation budget, in particular how radiation interacts with the surface. And one of the reasons why this is, has become a very important topic is because the radiation that arrives at the Earth's surface drives our climate. So understanding how much radiation arrives at the surface, what the nature of that is, obviously we're talking about radiation arriving from the sun, coming through the atmosphere and interacting with the surface. So that's the, the oceans, uh, the atmosphere, obviously that's not part of the surface, but the, 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 uh, the atmosphere captures radiation and moves it around, and then the interactions with the surface part, in particular the vegetation, so forests, crops, um, the stuff that drives pretty much all life on Earth and all the resources that we rely on for food and for shelter, uh, and obviously longer term looking back, that solar interaction with the, the surface has provided us with resources like um, fossil fuel resources. So understanding how radiation arriving from the sun and interacting with the Earth system is, is a crucial part of climate and then also the biogeochemical cycles, the cycles that underpin um, life on Earth. And obviously that's very important to us. We are part of that life on Earth and as we all know we're having um, a significant impact on that through all sorts of things, through fossil fuel emissions, through land use change, through intensive agriculture. Um, so all of those things link back to understanding how much light arrives at the surface and what the properties of that light uh, is and how it interacts. So radiation coming from the sun, the surface of the sun is at around 6,000 degrees Kelvin and it emits radiation across the ultraviolet into the visible part of the spectrum into the shortwave infrared and then the thermal infrared part of the spectrum and to, to longer wavelengths. Now, we, this is a, a spectrum, so that means it's a continuous distribution of radiation coming from the sun. Um, that distribution is described by what we call a, um, a black body energy distribution. So theoretically what that means is we consider the sun to be a, a, a black body. So it means that all the radiation that falls upon a black body is, is perfectly absorbed and then perfectly re-emitted. And the reason why we, um, we use that approximation is it, it, because it allows us essentially to calculate the amount of energy that's being emitted in this, in this distribution at every different wavelength along this, this spectrum. Then we sort of divide that spectrum up and we give it names. So those names are arbitrary, it's a continuous distribution, but we call different bits of it different things. So if we focus on one very important bit of it to us, that bit we call the visible. Uh, that's the reason why we call it the visible is because we can see it. So our eyes are sensitive to a very, very narrow part of the spectrum. So if we consider radiation coming from the sun to be distributed from um, about 0 0.3, 0 0.2 microns, a millionth of a metre, to uh, many centimetre wavelengths. So that spans orders of magnitude, many orders of magnitude. Our eyes are sensitive to a tiny, tiny part of that from about 0.4 to about 0.7 microns. So it's a tiny fraction of this, this overall spectrum, but it's the bit that we're sensitive to. And one question that um, you ought to be asking yourself is why are we sensitive to that bit of the spectrum? Um, you know, why is it so important to us? Why have we evolved eye systems that are very sensitive to this tiny part of the spectrum? And it's not just us. So photosynthesis, is also driven by this tiny fraction of radiation in this very, very long spectrum. Um, so why? Why this, just this part of the spectrum? And the reason is, is that when we look at this energy distribution, uh, it's described by something called the Planck function, uh, and this energy distribution from the sun has a very, very sharp peak. So it's a kind of, it's a distribution that looks like this. It has this extraordinarily sharp peak and then it drops off. That peak, not coincidentally, is right in the visible part of the spectrum. So the peak of the solar radiation is at this very, very narrow range of wavelengths. So when you look at the distribution of the sun's radiation overall, if you're going to evolve a system to be sensitive to a chunk of that spectrum, one chunk to be, to be looking at is the visible part because there is this massive peak of energy there. Everywhere else. So if we sort of sum this up, basically within this 0.4 to 0.7 micron little tiny slice, about 40% of the total solar energy 
is crammed into that space. So yes, yeah, 60% of the sun's energy is elsewhere, but it's spread over a much, much wider range of wavelengths. So a huge range of wavelengths. Um, so what that means is that there is, this, there is this very dramatic peak in the solar energy in that part of the spectrum. Okay, so it's not so surprising that evolution has, has driven optical systems in mammals and photosynthetic mechanism in plants. So chlorophyll, chlorophyll is sensitive to just this part of the spectrum. Um, what is perhaps less uh, obvious is that the radiation arriving at the top of the atmosphere has this distribution. That's not really the important bit. The important bit is the bit that, that hits the bottom here. Um, and the atmosphere is full of gases and water vapour. And so what the atmosphere does is it tends to absorb and scatter radiation. That absorption is, is crucial for a couple of reasons. One of the reasons is that the absorption of it keeps the, the, the radiation, the warmth, so the, the sunlight that passes through heats up the surface, some of it's absorbed. That heat radiation is then re-emitted at long wave parts of the spectrum and the atmosphere acts like a blanket, keeping that in. That's the greenhouse effect. Without that greenhouse effect, that radiation would escape and the Earth's surface would be completely frozen. So the thing is, how much radiation gets through the atmosphere? What happens to it on the way down? So sunlight can interact with clouds, it can, so water vapour, it can interact with uh, other gases, oxygen, ozone, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, methane, and various other species, and dust and soot as well. The crucial thing is though, so how much of that radiation gets through depends on what the atmosphere is made of. And there are parts of the spectrum that what we call atmospheric windows. And what that means is the atmosphere is largely transparent to radiation coming through at those wavelengths. There are large parts of the, the, the sun's wavelength that arrive the, the spectrum, that arrive at the top of the atmosphere, that don't get through because it, it's absorbed by gases and water vapour in the atmosphere. So it just turns out that there's a really narrow window in the spectrum right around where the peak of the sun's radiation is. So fortunate for two reasons, the sun's radiation peaks at 0.4 to 0.7 microns and at 0.4 to 0.7 microns there's a hole in the atmosphere which allows that radiation through to hit the surface, to be absorbed by plants, to warm up the surface, to evaporate water and to heat the bottom of the atmosphere and drive our whole climate. So this combination of the peak in the sun's radiation the atmospheric window then determines what we see here at the bottom of the atmosphere. So when we look out the window on a sunny day uh, and we see the, the sky is, is blue or it's cloudy, that radiation has to have got through the atmosphere. So anything that's going to evolve to survive on the Earth's surface has to be sensitive to those things. You go very slightly shorter wavelengths to the ultraviolet, so things that our eyes are not sensitive to, uh, but ultraviolet radiation, shorter wavelengths, so it has higher energy, that radiation is potentially very damaging. So we know it's very damaging to the tissues of plants and animals. It's what gives us skin cancer. So you only need to shift just to shorter wavelengths from the visible and you get to the ultraviolet. And what protects us there is the ozone in the atmosphere. That absorbs most of the ultraviolet radiation coming from the sun, or it did until we realised that the CFCs, the chlorofluorocarbons that we were putting in the atmosphere, was generating an ozone hole. It was decomposing the ozone and allowing more UV radiation through. So the composition of the atmosphere, the distribution of the sun's radiation, uh, determines entirely what we see here at the bottom of the atmosphere. So then the question is, what happens to the radiation at the surface? And there are a number of things that can happen. The sunlight can interact with the surface and be absorbed. If it's absorbed, then the radiation is, uh, warms things up. If it warms things up, it, those things give off that radiation as heat energy, and that changes the, the, the heat balance of the surface, it changes the heat balance of the atmosphere. The other thing that can happen is that that radiation can be reflected. So the reflectivity, or what we call the albedo of the surface, is essentially the, the, the proportion of that incoming radiation that just bounces back. So you can imagine that the two extremes there are if you have a very black surface, it will absorb everything. If you have a mirror, it will reflect everything back. And natural surfaces tend to be somewhere in between the two. So the brightest things around are things like snow and ice. 
So they reflect a lot of radiation back into the atmosphere, which is why they stay cold. The fact that they're so white prevents them from heating up. Whereas things, surfaces that are dark, so vegetation is one of those surfaces. So vegetation that is dark absorbs a lot of radiation. It uses it for photosynthesis, but it also heats up. So this balance between um, the albedo of, of bright and dark surfaces and the, the types of surface there are has this intimate link with incoming solar radiation, heating up the atmosphere, and then the drivers of our climate more generally, as well as the biogeochemical cycles, the life cycle part of the, of the Earth system.